I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to nationally acclaimed entomologist and author of the book Wasp, Richard Bugman Jones, about a species of wildlife that may not spring to mind as one of your immediate favourites. Wasps, yellow jackets, jaspers, stripy bastards, whatever you call these members of the insect world, and whether you love them or loathe them, I think you'll certainly learn lots about them, as Richard explains their life cycles and the roles they play in ecosystems. My admiration for wasps grows as I discover more, and I'm certainly a lot more tolerant of them than I would have been a few years back. Of course, we need to look out for our insect friends throughout the year. But at this time of the year, it's possible you'll realise there's a nest nearby, and if you can bear it, perhaps you could consider leaving it be. I have one in my porch, and as long as we don't get in each other's ways, me and the wasps are managing to coexist for the time being. And spare a thought for the queens when they wake up next spring and scout out new places to build nests. Perhaps you could be a little more tolerant of them too, given their already slim odds of surviving. If you're not convinced to become a full-blown wasp lover by the end of the episode, I suspect you will at least have a grudging respect for these resilient creatures. Richard and I begin by talking about the wasps you're most likely to observe when you're out and about. Oh, and to avoid a clash of the bug titans, I've left Dr Ian Bedford's segment off the end of this episode. Could you start by telling me how many species of wasp there are in the UK and which of them are, are most common? Aha, uh-huh, right. Well, goodness, there are. The trouble is with wasp, it's one of those rather vague terms that can mean almost anything from a tiny parasitoid up to a hornet. So starting as a whole, there's something like 12,000 species of wasp in this country. Most people wouldn't recognise them as wasps because they're tiny, they look like ants, or they're sort of black and thin. So what people would regard as wasps, sort of black and yellow things with a sting, there are about 250 different species. Oh, still a lot. Um, Still a lot. However, amongst those, that's the majority of these are what we call solitary wasps. They live on their own. They're very tiny. They're discreet. They make an individual burrow. They stock it with whatever prey they get for their particular uh, offspring, whatever their, their habits are. But what people tend to think of as wasps, what in North America are called the yellow jackets, uh, we've got nine species in Britain. And that includes the, the hornet, which is our biggest social wasp. So, um, wasp in the sense of the black and yellow thing that buzzes around your um, your picnic table or makes a nest, one of those sort of big buzzing paper nests up in the loft. Uh, they're they're the family of, uh, subfamily Vespinae, and uh, that's what most people would regard as as wasps. Okay, and of those nine, are, are there any that are particularly common? Um, uh, probably half of them. I mean, the, the two commonest are, um, uh, to, they have English names, but I'll get, we'll start with the Latin names. Vespula vulgaris is the common wasp, and Vespula germanica, the so-called German wasp, um, are equally abundant, and they're more or less ubiquitous across the whole of the British Isles. So could you describe the typical life cycle of a social wasp's nest? Right, well, it starts with only... Um, the queens surviving. Everything else is dead. Uh, the queens hibernate and they they have mated the previous year. They store the sperm in their bodies. They leave uh, their vicinity and they try and find a dry, warm place to overwinter. And it's usually under bark, under a log, perhaps inside a house or an outbuilding, some sort of dry crevice that they can spend the winter hiding in. When they emerge in April or May, Uh, Each one is a single lone queen. That's all there is. There are no workers. She has to start making a nest on her own. And she grazes on bark and and wood to create wood pulp that she makes into paper in her mouth. And she will go back and in uh, some sort of crevice or, or overhang, she will start to create her embryo nest, which is a little stalk um, with 15 or 16 little hexagonal cells sort of sprouting off it, and it's all enclosed in a thin paper envelope. And the whole thing's about the size of a golf ball. Uh, And she will um, 
create the cells. She'll lay an egg in each one of them. Uh, she'll look after them. Uh, when they hatch, she's got to go out and feed, feed them. So she can go off hunting for flies and caterpillars and aphids, whatever she can find, to bring back and to feed the growing grubs, that, that first sort of dozen or 15 um, larvae growing in the nest. Eventually, after a few weeks, they get to maturity. They cover over the entrance to the cell using silk, and they'll change into a pupa. And a few weeks later, they will emerge as the first cohort of worker wasps. And once they appear, they can then start taking over some of the duties of the nest. The queen will continue to go out to forage for food and for wood pulp, but she'll also lay eggs in, in the the next sort of batch of hexagonal cells, which added on to make the paper comb where the um, where the eggs are laid, um, and then after the next generation, as it were, the next cohort of wasps of um, worker wasps appear, maybe fifty now. Uh, it get that, once it's got to that stage, if it survives to that stage, then the queen can more or less sit in the nest all day long and her sole duty is to lay eggs where all the workers go off and, and they do all the working. They do all the building, protecting, hunting, feeding uh, for the rest of the, the colony's life. Mm -hmm. So she lays the, the eggs um, and what I thought was fascinating was that it actually most wasps are female particularly as you start the year and, and until you get to the end of the year. So can you explain a bit about how that works? Yeah, the, the hymenoptera, the whole hymenoptera bees, wasps and ants are completely bizarre in their, in their um, gender um, identification. It's very, very peculiar. And it's a, a very complex process called haplodiploidy. And what happens is that rather than, say, in mammals, where the gender is defined by the presence of X or Y chromosomes, in um, in wasps, it's it's dictated by the number of chromosomes. So all our cells have chromosomes. The DNA is accumulated into these sort of little nuggets of of matter. Uh, humans have twenty three pairs, and each cell of our body has twenty three pairs. And every time a cell reproduces, the chromosomes double up. They split. They create two new cells, each with twenty three pairs. The only time that doesn't happen is when we have the sex cells, the, the egg and sperm, in which case only one of each pair of those 23 chromosomes goes in. And it's, it's similar in wasps in that they have pairs of chromosomes uh, in their bodies, um, but only the males have pairs. And the way it works is um, when the queen mates, she stores the sperm, and when she comes to lay her eggs the next year, she stored them over, over winter. When she comes to lay her eggs the next year, each one inside its own little hexagonal cell in the combs, she decides whether to fertilize it with sperm. And if she doesn't fertilize it, she just lays an egg with no sperm attached to it. That only has her chromosomes in. So one single set of chromosomes, and that's destined to become a female. If she fertilizes it, then the chromosomes from the sperm get incorporated. There's twice the number of chromosomes, and that's destined to become a male. And so the queen actually can decide, uh, anthropomorphism may be too far, but it's, it's that action which determines whether the offspring from the egg she lays is going to be a female or a male. Um, the vast majority of all wasps are female because the vast majority, many thousands in a single nest, are the female workers. And although they're female, they're sterile, they don't lay eggs, but they are genetically and morphologically female. And it's only at the end of the year when the colony has reached maturity that the the colony then decides to create the new sexual generation of wasps, so new queens, the new fertile females, and the males. And so some of the eggs she starts to lay are fertilized, and they become the males. Um, and it's, it's a, a really complicated process. It's, it's, it's utterly bizarre. It took many hundreds of years of people trying to work out what was going on. It's bad enough that there should be three different sexes in any nest, you know, the males, uh, the, the females, queens, the workers, and 
and the males, the drones or whatever, but trying to work out genetically what was going on. It's, um, it's a very peculiar system. And it's only recently that people have worked out what's, what's happening. Yeah, I suspect there's more to find out. I mean, that presumably is a, is a conscious decision by, again, not to anthropomorphize, but it's a conscious decision for the Queen to fertilise. It, 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 it may be instinctive, but yes, it is. It's, it's a, I think because it only happens when the sat when the um the nest reaches maturity at the beginning of the season there's no point in producing males because there are no queens around anyway and the, the whole activity of the nest is is geared towards making the nest as big and bountiful as possible to get as many workers as possible and only when it's sort of got to this sort of uh, this population, well, a certain sort of level of population, a certain biomass of wasps in the nest, only then does the whole system sort of switch over to producing new queens and, and new males. The males have got a relatively short life then. They have. Uh, they mate, they live for hours or days possibly. They're very short-lived. Having said that, you know, a worker wasp doesn't live very long, just a few weeks. They, they literally work themselves to death. But, you know, the... the the males are a sort of um, almost like a sort of biological afterthought of the of the process, uh, and it's the same. If you could argue that the adult stage of almost any insect is a bit like that, because most of the um, life cycle of any insect is actually the larva. And the adults of so many insects are incredibly short lived, literally hours or days. So, for a male wasp only to live for a few days, it's not that unusual. No. How many wasps would a typical nest uh, contain? And do they self-regulate in terms of how much food sources are around them? Um, yes, the, the your average, no, I'm not sure there is an average nest. Um, if you find a big nest up in your loft, uh, they're the biggest ones. Um, usually they're, they're several years old, they're discarded, they're, they're not used. But you can dissect them and you can find the paper um, combs inside and you can do a rough count of how many cells there are um, and it's usually a thousand or so each one of those cells has probably been used three or four times over the life cycle of uh, the annual life cycle of, of the nest so an egg is laid in the grub hatches it's fed it grows it pupates it turns into an adult it leaves the comb on the whole that cell that it came out of it's only empty for a day or two, and then another egg is laid in there. So um, at the height of the season, you know, a big nest can have four or 5,000 workers coming and going. And cumulatively, over the year, quite easily 10,000 wasps could have emerged in a single nest. Wow. Um, that's, that's the very big nests of the very common species. Hornets are much smaller. They perhaps only have two or 300 um, in the nest some of the wasps don't make nests in quite a lot of uh, wasps they, they dig in the ground they make a hollow in the ground they're the ones you also find in the loft because a, a loft space is is really just a cave as far as a wasp is concerned um, but they make their nests hidden away from the light but there are some wasps that make their nests hanging in a tree um, uh, or in a bush um, and they tend to be slightly smaller. So again, probably only have two, two thousand or three thousand over the over the uh, course of a life of a, a yearly life cycle of the nest. They use the the nests for a year. At the end of that time, is it possible that that some another wasp might come back and reuse that same nest? No, because the, the every at the end of the season, every single wasp except the new queens that have emerged dies off. Um, so each and and each of those new wasps, those new queens, will found her nest again from scratch. It's impossible for a queen to go back and sort of reuse an old nest because um, it's too complicated. It's too dirty. There's probably diseases. There are pests in there. Other predators. It started to fall apart. It doesn't make uh, sort of economic sense to. Uh, renovate what is effectively, you know, a sort of multi-storey tower block when really what she needs to do is start off by making a, a garden shed and sort of working her way up from that. Yeah, right. So um, so no, when you find a nest, it's empty. It will never be reused. Right. 
Uh, so people quite often go up into their loft and, uh, you know, but you buy a new house as we did. There was no loft access in the house. First house we ever bought. We, we cut a hole and, uh, and up we went. And there was a massive great nest the size of uh, um, an inflated uh, bin bag. Um, but of course, it had been empty probably for five or 10 years. Um, and, and we were able to take it down and dissect it and, and count how many, um, how many wasps had been reared through it. Yeah. So when you see them, don't panic. That's exactly right. Yeah. You can always tell if a wasp nest is active because they're made of paper and they reverberate. And just as um, a, a hi fi speaker, is that the the, uh, the loudspeaker, the, the bit that re- reverberates, is quite often made of paper. Um, if the wasps are occupying it, the whole thing buzzes, and the paper amplifies the sound of the wasps buzzing inside. So you can always tell an active wasp nest because it it, it buzzes quite loudly if you're anywhere near it. Mm. Well, I'm not going to dwell on the topic of, of getting rid of wasps' nests, but um, I thought it might be really interesting to note uh, the success rate of new colonies, just in case anybody is thinking of getting rid of one. The kind of the, the, the effort that's been involved in establishing a successful colony is quite flabbergasting, isn't it? It is, yeah. And in fact, the mortality rate is incredibly high. Um, probably uh, one in 10,000 overwintering queens successfully rears a new colony. Um, quite a lot of those queens will die through predation or fungal infection over over the winter. And when they're founding their new nest, it's the size of a golf ball. It's hidden away somewhere. She's got to be able to guard it, to look after it. She's got to be able to forage and find food for the grubs when they hatch. She's working on her own. She's got no backup. And so this is an incredible vulnerable time. So she's vulnerable to predation or disease. If the weather's bad, she can't get out, she can't forage, the wasps are going to starve. Uh, quite often, they, the nests are, are built low down on the ground. They're always uh, susceptible to inundation, to flooding, to mold, to fungi, whatever. So um, the, And you can quite often find embryo nests We've been attempted and then obviously have failed somehow. The queen's died. Something's happened. And you can quite often find two or three of these nests in the same place, perhaps in a shed or in, in a loft, next door to a big nest. And it's because they, the, the queen wasps each year have come and they found what they think is a, a nice, safe, secluded space. They found a way in uh, through an air brick or under the eaves or through a hole in the woodwork. And they found this nice dark space and they tried to make their nest and then something has happened. Um, so the, the the actual number that get through very, is very low compared to the number of um, queen wasps which are, uh, over winter as uh, hibernators. Mm, that is that is staggering. Um, talking about the queen wasps and actually I suppose the males and the females, do they all sting? No, no, it, this is um, it's a, a, an undeniable biological fact that the sting is actually part of the egg-laying apparatus in a wasp. So only queens, sorry, only females can sting. Um, and even though workers don't have functional ovaries and they don't lay eggs, they've still got the sting apparatus and they can still sting. Males, on the other hand, and this is, this is across all bees, wasps and ants, it's only the females which have got the sting, the venom sac that, that gives the pain. None of the males are armed like that because none of the males have um, the egg-laying apparatus. And th- there's an evolutionary reason for this in that um, wasps evolved, and, and bees and, wasp, uh, and ants, they all evolved from sort of wasp-like ancestors which used their sting to kill or at least paralyze prey on which they would then lay an egg. So it, it was only the females, the egg-laying uh, individuals who needed a sting to, to catch the prey so that they could lay their egg on it. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I was quite um, surprised to find that out. And, and that was quite a recent revelation for me, actually. Um, it doesn't make a great deal of difference to most people, though, because <laughs> no. uh, virtually every every wasp in the world is a female. <laughs> yeah. uh, a tiny percentage produced at the end of the year are males. Once you get your eye in, you can tell them uh, males have got an extra abdominal segment. That's quite tricky to tell. And they've got one extra antennal segment as well. But their antennae tend to be a bit longer. So once once you get your eye in, you can tell that the 
the social wasp is a male because the, the antennae are just a fraction longer and a bit curled. And if you grab them, of course, everyone gasps <laughs> because they, they think, oh, he's, he's picked up, um, he's picked <laughs> up a wasp. Man. And in fact, yeah, and in fact, the wasp, the male wasp will sham attack. It will try, it will bend its abdomen around and poke you on the finger with its blunt abdomen. Oh. And it's trying to elicit a startle response. Um, uh, uh, but of course, there's no, there's no sting in there. There's no pain. It, but it, it, it's enough to make the uninitiated let go immediately. Mm, definitely. Um, but you, you have to know your wasps to be absolutely certain that, um, that you are picking up a male because otherwise you soon find out that actually you've got it wrong. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> uh, so what's worse, a hornet, a wasp or a bee sting? Oh, honeybee sting, by far the worst. And that's because, um, well, two reasons. First of all, honeybee sting shafts are barbed. So when they sting you, you brush off the bee, the sting actually stays lodged in your skin. And with it, the venom sac that's still pumping in the venom. So it's a tiny amount of venom that's been put in there, you know, a, a, I don't know, 20, 50 thousandth of a gram. It's a teeny tiny amount. It's damn painful. Um, and if you don't get rid of that venom sac immediately, it's still pumping in extra venom. And so it's incredibly painful. And the other thing is that that venom sac, once you've flicked off the eviscerated bee, um, that venom sac is giving off a scent, uh, an alarm pheromone, which alerts the other honeybees that something is attacking the nest. It's already been stung by one of the sisters. Everybody out, kill it. Um, and, and you're literally tagged. You're actually labelled with this thing stuck in your skin, telling all the other bees that you are the enemy and they'll come after you. So a, a honeybee sting is by far the most dangerous type of sting. Um, having said that, the actual pain elicited by the wasp or hornet is more or less the same. There's, there's no real distinction. Um, and it's it it can be extremely excruciatingly painful, especially if you're um, if you're particularly susceptible to some of the venom uh, constituents. Mm. Yeah. So why do we persecute wasps so much? Ah, it's, a, it's an old story. I think it's because bees, obviously, or honeybees at least, um, have been revered through history because they give us honey, which for millennia was the only sweet substance available to most people. Um, and they give us beeswax, which is an incredibly uh, useful product. Um, wasps, it's not until recently when people realise that wasps are key um, parts of the ecological system for sort of controlling other insects. They're major predators. And they, they keep, they help the sort of checks and balances of, of preventing outbreaks and plagues of, of other insects. But that's only a recent discovery. And so it's really tied down to the fact that, that bees had a commercial product that was associated with them and wasps didn't. Um, and it's quite nice that people like Plutarch and quite a few of the ancient writers actually considered wasps to be degenerate bees. You know, they, they couldn't keep up with the hive ethic. And so, and so they, they sort of turned into this sort of nasty, stinging creature. And all it does is, is, is go around annoying people and then giving them pain, yeah. uh, which, is a, which is a real shame. But now, now people certainly are, they're becoming much more aware that wasps are very important. There are a few wasp pollinators. That's the other thing, that bees are very well known for pollinating. They're, they're valued for their pollination abilities. Wasps also pollinate a lot of wild flowers, um, but it's mostly that, that wasps are very good at uh, eating other insects. So they are, they're, they're like spiders and birds. They're, they're the most, uh, one of the most um, important predators of other insects. And so other insects like you know, flies and caterpillars and aphids and, and quite a lot of bugs which people consider pests and nuisances, they're, they're targeted by wasps and, and the numbers are kept down. Mm. So in view of the fact that our insect populations are dropping left, right and centre, is this also having a detrimental effect on wasp populations? It probably is. So all this is slightly speculative at the moment, these sort of insect declines. Um, that they're, they're Anecdotally, they're well known. Um, there's now a bit more sort of firm scientific evidence. Um, and on the whole, people focus um, on the whole biomass of insects and, and wasps in particular are not are not um, are not taken out of that and commented on. 
Um, unfortunately, when people look at these reports, they, they, they immediately think about, oh, it's getting rid of the bees, it's getting rid of the hoverfly pollinators, it's getting rid of the bu butterflies. But wasps are in there too. Um, and all these, all these creatures, they're all declining. We don't know who is declining most in relation to what else, but they're, they're all going down. Hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I suppose we probably need to champion them as much as we do the other insects. Well, I think so too. And I mean, wasps are particularly interesting because um, because they are, they're sort of slightly offbeat and people don't like them or rather people are a bit nervous of them because they, they don't know enough about them. But once you start telling people, you know, how important they are as predators, how fascinating their nesting behaviour is, the you know, this sort of bonkers chromosome thing about haplodiploidy and sex determination um, and the... the um, the biochemistry of venoms it's it's utterly fascinating um and there are historical uh, precedents of people moving wasps nests around uh, not the big social wasp nest but the slightly smaller ones but moving them around crop fields to try and uh, uh, to try and control some of the pests in the crops um, and in fact, the, the, the report came out just a few days ago, I noticed. Um, the very unfortunately named, I think, uh, I think it's a North American species of wasp called Polistes satan. Mm -hmm. I think someone was having a, a sort of an ironic, uh, humor, humorous day when they named that one, um, which is a real shame. But it, that particular wasp is, is, is absolutely linked with um, uh, pest control. And the more, the more of those wasps there are around, the lower the pests are in the fields. So, it's, you know, we, we are, we're getting that. Yeah, I, just, I get the feeling that, and I'm not a scientist, but I get the feeling there is there is more to find out about wasps um, and, and it will be fascinating, I'm sure. Um, but just to finish up, I wondered if you could just maybe touch on the subject of the uh, foreign invading wasps and hornets and, and whether we've got anything to worry about that. Uh, well, the thing is that several wasps have invaded Britain in the past anyway. There was the famous um, Dolica vespula media, which appeared in the 70s, and it really started to spread in the 1980s. Scientific name, uh, Dolica vespula media, and it's often called the median wasp because it's halfway in size between the other social wasps and the hornet. The workers were as big as queen other wasps, and the queen Dolica vespula were the size of hornets, practically. And it's a very striking creature, very, very dark compared to our native species. And of course, the tabloids were awash with dreadful headlines about invading killer euro wasps. So much nonsense. Um, and in fact, the dollar, it's now become subsumed in the sort of natural ecology of British wildlife. And it, it hasn't done, it hasn't really had any effect on anything as far as we can see in, in the general ecology of, of life in Britain. Um, there is a danger, though, that the, uh, the Asian hornet, uh, Vespa bellatina, might do something. And that, that's partly because rather than just expanding its range across Europe, as the medium wasp did, that's a, that was a native European wasp and the other creatures that live in Europe had had millions of years of evolution of predating it and being predated, you know, eaten by it and so on. But the Asian hornet is a wholly new creature. It's been accidentally introduced from the Far East. And when you get that sort of intercontinental movement, um, you have the possibility for massive in invasion. And that's because the new creature has effectively left behind all its normal predators, diseases, parasites. It's, it's uh, arrived in an open, uh, a, you know, blank continent where it can just expand uh, and take over. And that's what it's done in quite a lot of Europe. And it's, um, it's spread uncontrolled, unchecked, because there's nothing out there that predates it normally. Um, and uh, although it's widespread in, in France, and of course that's the one that beekeepers are particularly worried about because it targets honeybees as, as its sort of favoured prey item. Mm. It has been introduced into Britain. There are records. It's been successfully eradicated on the few occasions it has turned up in Britain. Um, but I think beekeepers and you know naturalists in this country are still on high alert we need to keep a look out for this thing and if possible try and prevent it from getting into mainland britain mm -hmm. it's, in, it's in the channel islands and i think it's already a, a bit of a nuisance there but if, if the trouble is that once once it gets established in britain you know it doesn't take long before it's uncontrollable 
there's no closing the stable door once it's arrived. No. Okay, so that is one to worry about. Well, be on that is one to watch out for. Yes. Okay, cool, brilliant. So, um, where can people get your book if they wanted to get hold of a copy? It's available from all good bookstores, um, and it's available online. So it's it's uh, just called Wasp. It's by me, Richard Jones, and it's in the Animal series published by Reaction Books. Thank you very much, Richard, for taking part in the episode. My takeaway from the episode is probably the same as it is from many of these episodes, and that is to concentrate on leaving things natural and leaving things be. Whether that be leaving patches of wildflowers to grow, leaving soil undug, grass unmown, leaves unraked, or it means choosing natural products over processed products, the message is becoming more and more obvious as I research episodes and speak with guests. The wildlife we have needs a more natural environment, Even wasps, when building their papery nests, need unpainted, unvarnished wood from which to harvest the materials to build them. This message is relevant to gardeners, and in fact everyone. The less we process materials, the less we interfere and leave things natural, the better. And I know there are people who will argue against this point of view, but quite often they're those who profit from the alternative. Do you have any thoughts about this? Are you getting the same sense from listening to episodes? Please do let me know what you think email or contact me on social media. I've loved hearing from those of you that have already got in touch. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.